Turn your Bibles, if you would, to Revelation chapter 3. Revelation 3. What I'm about to share with you, I find absolutely mind-boggling. Because the book of Revelation came to the Christians just before, or at the very beginning, of a major persecution. The Emperor Trajan, who served as the emperor from uh, 98 AD to 117 AD, actually made it illegal to be a Christian. And Jesus, as he writes these letters, he knows this is coming because we're around 70, 72 AD at the moment. So Trajan made it so that if you were accused of being a Christian, you were brought before the proconsul, you were told if you would curse Jesus and worship the gods, you would be spared. Otherwise, you would be tortured and executed. So Revelation then is written to prepare the people in John's day for what's coming. And the amazing thing is that it worked. As a whole, the church stayed strong and changed the entire known world, even though it meant their lives and they knew it would mean their lives. One illustration we have is six Christian men from Carthage are in dialogue with each other. We read in their letters that they were brought up on charges or they were about to be brought up on charges rather before the proconsul. The story goes that Saturnius, the proconsul, said to the six men, swear now, before the Lord, our emperor. So pay homage, you know, burn incense, uh, metaphorically speaking, to the emperor. And their response went like this. They said, we have not committed any wrong. We have committed no theft. When we buy something, we pay tax on it. We do this because we know our Lord, who no one sees with these eyes. He is the king of kings, Lord of lords, and the emperor of all nations. Saturnius said to the Christ followers, have a delay of 30 days and rethink this. But their response was immediate. No, we don't need 30 days. If we come back 30 days from now, our response will be the same. We are Christ followers. We are Christians. We are followers of the way. We will not recant. And as a result, Saturnius says, since you have obstinately persisted, it is determined that you will be put to death by the sword. What was their response? Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. It's amazing. They knew that what they were about to say would lead to their torture and death. And what do they do? They quote this book of Revelation. They say, we know our Lord who no one sees with these eyes. He's the King of kings and Lord of lords. Now we're in a series. This is crucial. We're in a series called Heart Check. And we're looking at the seven churches of Asia Minor. And we're saying that Jesus writes a letter to these seven churches. And as he does so, we could go down the path of talking about the end times. We could have a very eschatological series, but we're not. We're simply taking these letter that he's, letters that he's written to the churches and we're having a heart check. We're saying, what is it that's in our heart and does it matter? Because as Jesus writes these words to these seven churches, it reveals to us what Christ expects to see in our hearts. Remember, he's the one who has eyes of blazing fire. He's able to look through the external and see who we are and what we're really made of on the inside. And we come to this area now, right here, of Sardis and Philadelphia. They're about 28 miles away from each other. And we're going to learn something crucial when it comes to our heart. And that is this. Once you take Jesus into your heart, once you have a genuine, authentic conversion, we're going to learn that you become a person of endurance. It's the Greek word that I want you to pay very close attention to because it's the theme of most of the book of Revelation. It's two words. Hupo mone. Mone means endurance. Hupo means hyper. So they hyper endured. No matter what they faced, they became people of endurance. Now think about these early Christians for a moment. In their minds, they know it is a literal historical fact that Jesus rose from the dead. Now, if your teacher or master rose from the dead, that's huge because that means there's nothing he can't do. And yet, yet they're suffering. So a part of them would do what we would do wait a minute, you rose from the dead, you have all this power, and yet look at my life. How many of us have wanted to look up to heaven and say, God, come on, God, you got all this power, and my life stinks. It's not going the way that I hoped it would go. So 28 miles from Sardis is the church at Philadelphia. It was founded by Attalus II in 150 BC, and the love and loyalty between Attalus and his brother Uminus won for him this idea of Philadelphia or brotherly love. That's what the city of Philadelphia means. But the city was founded and actually guarded a very important pass through the mountains so that Philadelphia became known as the keeper or the door 
to the Eastern Highlands. Jesus reminds Philadelphia, he says, I am the one though who holds the key and is able to open and close doors. Now listen, we can talk so much about what's going on in Sardis and Philadelphia, but sometimes a verse like this will jump out on the page and we gotta hone in on it. He says, I'm the one who holds the key and is able to open and close the door. And then he says, see, I have placed before you, talking to the church of Philadelphia, an open door that no one can shut. And here's why it will be successful in verse 10, since you have kept my command to endure patiently. So anytime you look at open door in the Bible, it's an opportunity or a, a, a metaphor kind of for the opportunity of the success or the progression of the gospel. So then in verse 9 in chapter 3, he says, I will make those who are the synagogue of Satan, who claim to be Jews, though they are not, but are liars, I will make them come and fall down at your feet and acknowledge that I have loved you. Folks, this is amazing because the synagogue in Philadelphia violently persecuted the Christians. In fact, they partnered together with the pagans in order to put the Christians to death. They had a common enemy, the Christ followers. But Jesus comes along and tells them that because they have endured so well, it will not be long until this synagogue of Satan, until the Jews recognize I love you and I've made a covenant with you. And then he says, I will make them come and fall down at your feet and acknowledge that I have loved you. And that Greek phrase, fall down at your feet, is an, is an idea of uh, adoration. So Jesus says to them, these hard, obstinate people are about to become your friends because you've responded, because you've endured, and because you've endured so well the persecution that they have thrust upon you, your response now is gonna open their eyes to the truth that I have always loved you. In other words, because you've been so patient in your response to closed doors, I'm gonna open new ones. Doors that you never thought could be opened. Now folks, we're gonna hone in on this because I don't know what you might face this week, and some of you might be in difficult times right now, but I'm pretty sure none of us are gonna be covered in pitch and burned, crucified upside down, tied to a pole and devoured by lions, or have our head chopped off. And yet, if that's what they experienced and they were able to hyper endure, could we not do the same? If we stand for Christ through this next generation, and this is a time to look at the message to the churches and just back off just for a moment, it's gonna cost us something. Trouble is coming upon us. We will pay a penalty for speaking against the things the Bible condemns. It's the way culture goes. In fact, we already are. It's getting more and more difficult to state the truth of the Bible without getting shamed or canceled or even aggressively attacked. Let me just talk to the room right here in California for a moment. There are teachers right here in Southern California, teachers that attend our church that are expressing to me that it's getting more and more difficult to be a Christ follower because they're forced to hide crucial information from parents and they feel that's a violation of integrity and character. They're being told they have to force to go along with the deception that a biological girl is a boy, a boy, a girl, despite the fact that God has made them male and female. They're being told that if they do not perpetuate the delusion in the life of a child, they can lose their jobs. So it's happening already. But according to the Bible, and no one knows when the end comes. And no matter who tells you they do, they just don't. And we don't know when the intensity or how intense it will be before the end. We simply know that history is cyclical. There will be seasons and times when we will face a lot of persecution. But look what they faced, and they hyper-endured. And as a result, God opened incredible doors for them. So the question is, how is it that you and I can stand firm when God makes no promise to us that, he, that you and I will not suffer to some degree, even economic hardship for doing what is right? If they hyper stood, can we not do the same? And I've given you three symbols on the board that I find in this chapter in the book of Revelation. And I think these are the keys for you and I enduring a very difficult time when we'd want to look up to God and say, God, come on, what's going on? A door, a key, and a pillar. A door and a key and a pillar. First, the door. Again, I don't know what you're going through right now, but I know this with certainty. And this is not theory to me, this is experience. If you endure patiently whatever Christ has brought in or allowed to come into your life, I guarantee you there will be huge doors that will open on the other side. You lose a relationship, you lose a job, a career, even a health setback. Everyone's a runner. 
Some people just run to God rather than away from him. If you run to God, you'll find yourself running smack dab into a door you never thought could be opened. I know he tells them in Revelation 3, verse 8, the the third part of the verse there, he says, I know that you have little strength. You've kept my word and have not denied my name. He says, you're weak. I know you're weak. I know you're small in number. I know you're not overly talented. However, people you never thought you could win over, you're about to win over because of your endurance. Let me tell you something that we all pastors, we pastors learn in our lives. Without closed doors, you would never discover open ones. Even pagan Greek proverbs understand this. Pothamot, mothama, suffering is education. Now, when I was younger and I read this, I used to think, what a load of rubbish, right? What a, what a cop-out. I suppose the next thing you're going to say to me is, what doesn't kill me makes me stronger. I used to hate that until I realized who said it and what the context was in which it was spoken. Do you know who said it? Martin Luther King. Martin Luther King used to deliberately seek out the meanest Southern sheriffs for a series of peaceful confrontations. And the reason he did this is because he knew that the beatings and the jailings and the brutalities would spark a complacent nation to rally around his cause, which he believed they would do. In fact, they ended up doing only when they witnessed the evil of racism. So what does he mean then? In what context does he say, what doesn't kill me makes me stronger? He's saying that the sufferings of his life will open up the door to the greatest victories of his life. He's not speaking of his own strength, although that's probably true too. He's speaking of his cause. His cause becomes stronger when he endures brutality, torture, and imprisonment. Teachers, as you stand for the cause of Christ and for truth, it may cost you, but it will open greater doors. And I'm right here with you. I think there'll come a time when I'll be arrested for a type of sermon that I spoke last week. But I think it will open greater doors. The church prospers during persecution. But folks, this isn't just a biblical concept. It's an everyday life reality. If you go to great art galleries today, you go to the great art galleries of the world, or you listen to some of the greatest music of all time, you soon realize that closed doors have enriched the lives of people who paint them or write them. And it's given them more wisdom and compassion and made them more humane. I've often said, how does God train a preacher? Suffering. He has to suffer. She has to suffer. Why? Because at that point, they begin to empathize and sympathize with people who are traveling the same road. I've got a friend right now, a close friend of mine, who's going through anxiety disorder. He's in the early stages. And when I heard that, I, I said to my wife, let's go see him because I know what he needs to hear. Because I, when I went through that, it doesn't matter what anybody says to you, it just it doesn't resonate. But somebody who's been through it, been there, I went over and I saw the look in his eyes, that stare that takes you into the spin. I saw that he was nervous. He was afraid. His heart rate was going up. His blood pressure sky high. And in that moment, because I had been through this journey, because I faced a closed door for over three years, I was able to open a new one for him. And I told him, as bad as this is, God is about to open doors in your life that could never be previously opened. Paul Turnier, the famous Swiss physician and counselor, recalls his surprise when he read an article entitled, Orphans Lead the World. In fact, there's an entire book written about this now. The article appeared in respected medical journals, and it surveyed the lives of 300 leaders who had great impact on world history. And he looked for a common thread. And after searching year after year, research after research, he found it. What is the common thread among those who have achieved greatness? They were orphans. Alexander the Great, Jules Caesar, George Washington, Napoleon, Queen Victoria, Golda Meir, Steve Jobs, Babe Ruth, Ed, Edgar Allan Poe. Here's the thing of life. Closed doors can make you better or bitter, soft or hard, break you or mend you, but you will never be the same. You say, Jeff, I wish I could be that person, but I can't. How can I? Here's the second key. <laughs> no pun intended. The key. Only Christ can open and close doors. What he opens, nobody can close. What he closes, no one can open. But then there's the key. He calls it the key of David. He says, there are, these are the words of him who is holy and true, who holds the key of David. What he opens, no one can shut. What he shuts, no one can open. 
Jesus tells the church in Philadelphia, remember, they're suffering immensely, economically, physically. And yet he tells them, stay patient. You've endured. And because you've endured, I'm going to open doors you never thought possible. And now Jesus says, I'm the one who has the key to these doors. What I open, no one can shut. What I shut, no one can open. Now, there are two aspects to this. I'm only going to deal with the second because the first would take too much time. But people in Jesus' day lived in what are called insulas. There were little mini compounds, and there was no way to have any privacy because you had the whole family and the whole community. In fact, there were actually roads and streets that would pass right through the center of your insula. There'd be a walkway right through your home. So as a result, you had to lock everything up, the kitchen, the pantry, the bedroom, the linens, the towels, because whoever had the key had the access to everything. Jesus is saying, I'm the one that has the keys to every room in the house. I have absolute power and access to every area of your life. You say, okay, Pastor Jim, but what does that mean? It means that you're not in control of your life. You're not in charge of your life and you never have been. He unlocks and locks. Did you choose the economic climate into which you were born? No. Did you choose your talents, your temperament, your family life? Whether by nature or nurture, it all came from the outside. And the sooner we realize that, the more we'll be able to endure because we'll know that no door is open unless Christ himself opens it. No door is closed unless Christ closes it. This past Friday, again, coming back to Southern California here, we celebrated uh, and we had a fundraiser for what we call God's Pantry. God's Pantry is the place in the middle of our campuses that we desperately wanted to create so that no matter where we were in the valley, when we met a homeless person, when we met someone who was an addict, when we met someone with any kind of need, we didn't just pray for them and send them on their way, but we had a place, a city on a hill that could not be hidden that we could send them and they would be restored They'd be healed by compassion, empathy, and also by the power of the Spirit of God. And now that place exists. 2,500 families per week receiving counseling, temporary housing. I love it. It's who we are at our church. One and all, it's who we are. We live for that kind of thing. But I also remember the year before we established God's Pantry, there was a huge property not too far from where we are at the San Dimas campus that came up for sale. And I knew, I just knew in my heart, at least I thought I did, God was going to give us this property because I thought we'd have a big church and lots of parking and we can do multi-services and it just fell through. And I remember being upset with God. Why didn't you open that door? It makes perfect sense that you would open that door for us so that we could have a fully devoted follower of Jesus in every home in this valley. But he didn't, he closed it. Not too long after that, I got this vision. God gave me a dream of this one and all care center, this God's pantry. And I met with a guy named Tom Sweeney who was already reaching out to people in the community who were in poverty, who were less fortunate. He said when he came to the meeting, he thought I was going to tell him, hey, our church would like to support you in this. Maybe he'll give me a thousand or two thousand dollars. But I remember his look on his face when I sat across him and I said, one and all wants to raise 1.5 million. He didn't know what to think about that. He had a dream. God gave me a vision and God inspired his people and we delivered. And now there is this place, the city on the hill that cannot be hidden that was only open because the other door was closed. I think of all the money we would have spent on bricks and mortar and we wouldn't have been able to do what we're doing in God's pantry by doing what the church is called to do, not to build a kingdom for itself, but to build the kingdom of God. But whose vision was it really? Whose provision was it really? Was it Tom? Was it me? No, it's God's vision, God's resources. He determines the doors that are open and the ones that are closed. As we were celebrating, as we were having a a fundraiser, we had a comedian by the name of Nazareth, and he told a funny story about a young man who was being interviewed on the radio, quite a famous young man. We'll leave his name unnamed. But he said, the... uh, The interviewer said, do you have any regrets in your life? And suddenly this young man started talking about a hamster. He said, yes, I do. I had a hamster once and I had five friends. We wondered what it would be like to make a little parachute and uh, parachute our hamster off the office building, six stories high. We thought he'd just float down and we'd catch him at the bottom. But when we let him go, the wind picked up and the wind blew him right over the city. We watched as he continued to sail further and further away across the bay onto a little island. 
After he told the story, a young lady called into the radio and said, man, I can't believe that. That year, my family and I lived on the other side of the bay and I was begging my mother for a hamster. And she said, if God wants you to have a hamster, he'll send you one. Sure enough, I was playing in the backyard and a hamster parachuted down from heaven. Amazing story. But it goes to show you, (laughs) things happen for which we have no other explanation other than God. Social science tells us we take credit for all the good things that happen to us, but blame the world for everything else for all the bad. Now, somebody might be saying, Jeff, I have a hard time with this. I know what you're saying. At least I think I do. But I just don't think God would allow some of the things into my life that you say he's allowed into my life. I mean, are you saying that God holds the key to every door? If something comes into my life, are you saying that God saw it and did not stop it, even if it was at a tragic event? even if I'm struggling financially, economically? Friends, there's no other option. That's what it means to say that God is omnipotent and omniscient or omniscient. We don't just say that because we want to. These are truths that are clearly communicated in Scripture. He's omnipotent. He has all-powerful. He's omniscient. He's all-knowing, which means that if anything comes into your life, God knew it was coming, and he has the power to stop, prevent it, or allow it to proceed. Your response might be, well, it's obvious then God does not love or care about me because I've had so much trouble in my life. And my first response is, wait a minute, he gave you his one and only son and secured your eternal life. So if he never does, never does another thing, he's done enough. But second, remember, you and I have no idea how many tragic, evil, and unfortunate events God has prevented in our lives because we'll never see those. If it's true that Satan is trying to destroy us, why hasn't he destroyed us? Is it possible that as difficult as our life has been, there are still so many other events that were perpetrated by the one who's trying to destroy us, but God raised his hand and said, this far, no further. But but Jeff, God could have protected the six men who showed great courage in the story you told in the beginning. He could have spared Antipas in Pergamum. He could have spared all the disciples who died horrific martyrdom deaths. They all died horrific deaths. And in every case, their response was the same before they were about to die. Praise be to God. May we be found worthy to share in his sufferings. What are they saying when they say that? Well, they're mimicking Hebrews 12, where we're told that for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. When they say, praise be to God, may we be found worthy, they're saying basically, may we endure the crosses of our lives so that we too may open the door for people who are far from God to come near, which is exactly what Jesus did. In Fox's book of Martyrs, the history of martyrdom in the Christian church, it begins the work by saying the church continued to grow, planted and rooted firmly in the doctrine of the apostles and watered plentifully by the blood of the saints. Do you see this? The manner in which the early church responded to closed doors, even death, Open the doors for the church to explode throughout the Greco-Roman world, and it did. So the letters that Jesus wrote to the church worked. It prepared them. They were ready, and they endured, hyper-endured. But you say, how are they able to suffer so courageously? And the answer is simple. The kingdom of God was more real to them than the kingdom of man. There was a bigger picture than the ease and convenience of their lives the redemption and salvation of everyone around them. In their minds, Christ's coming was just around the corner. Nothing else really mattered. Suffering is only temporary, but the kingdom of God lasts forever. Sometimes when I talk to parents who are so concerned about their children who have walked away from Jesus, I like to ask them a a simple question. It's simple, but it's at the same time, it's difficult. I say, how many of you parents would be willing to say this to God? Do whatever you have to do in me that my children would come back to you. You see, whether we like it or not, there's no better testimony than your response to difficulty or suffering. And when your children see your faith, when they hear it, that's one thing. But when you demonstrate it by enduring through very difficult times, when your faith and trust in Jesus grows in the midst of tragedy rather than weakens, it's compelling. Jesus knows very well this is the way the world works. So he prepares his church. And the words of the saints should give us great comfort. He's the King of kings and Lord of lords. What he opens, no one can shut. What he shuts, no one can open. Now, just a quick warning. Don't tempt God. 
One of my favorite comedians, Michael Jr., uh, hilarious, and he's clean, so that makes it enjoyable. He says, you know, I love, I love sports, but he says, my coach always told me, referring to his football coach, my coach always told me, Michael, the things I'm teaching you here, it's not just about this game. You can apply it to all of life. And Michael says, coach, here's the thing about that statement. It's not true. You need to stop saying that immediately. And Michael Jr. then says, because I got a job right out of high school parking cars. And one of the cars I was asked to park was really nice. So I guess he was a valet. So I took it for a little spin, probably a little longer than I needed to. The company found out, so my boss lost the account. And he starts yelling and screaming at me. And I didn't know what to do. So I thought back to my high school football coach. And I looked at my boss and I said, you know what, coach? Or you know what, man? You win some, you lose some. You can't let this one loss get you down. And the important thing is, I went out there and had some fun. (laughs) I thought about that. Yeah, that probably wouldn't work with your boss. The point is, don't do stupid things and then claim God sent this into your life to make you stronger. You drank yourself into oblivion and your wife left you. Your children hate you. Why did God open this door? He didn't open that door. You cheated on your wife and destroyed your family. Why did God close that door? You refused community and then you experienced tragedy and no one from the church came around to help you. Why did God not open that door? There's no discipleship in your life. Now you don't feel God. Why does God hide from me? Why did he close this door? God didn't open and close those doors. Ironically, however, and this is the beauty of grace and mercy and a compassionate God, even though some doors were not opened by God, when repentance comes, he redeems them. So the repentant alcoholic can become a voice for sobriety. The repentant adulterer can become a voice for faithfulness. The repentant isolationist can become a voice for community. And one who has felt the pain of a lack of discipleship can become a voice for the beauty and wonder of seeking God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. I'll tell you how we can endure. We can endure by understanding there are opening closed doors. And sometimes when God, oftentimes, maybe every time God closes a door, it prepares you. If you endure, it prepares you for an open door that you never could have opened on your own. And then if you trust that he has the key to opening closed doors, there's no accidents. There's nothing that catches him by surprise. He either allows it, stops it. He either opens it or he closes it. And what he opens, nobody can close. What he closes, no one can open. And then third, there is a pillar. The door, the key, and the pillar. Now, just quickly, in the key aspect of things, the Christ follower says, the Lord is my light and my salvation. What he closes, I will endure. What he opens, I will walk through. And can I tell you that in no way do I mean to belittle what some of us are going through. See, that's the danger of a message like this. You deal with theory, you deal with objective truth, but you forget that subjective feelings are very real. And there are some people who are hurting. And that's why I have learned to pray Psalm 23 as a prayer and a request. I've learned every day that I have to be praying, Lord, make me lie down in green pastures. Lord, lead me beside still waters. Lord, restore my soul that even though I walk through the valley of shadow of death, I will not fear any evil. Because I know that you open and close doors because I know that you have the keys to the open and the closed doors. Then give me strength and give me a prevailing presence and give me peace. Restore my soul that I can endure the way you've called me to endure as I live my life for a kingdom bigger and beyond myself. In the case of the church of Philadelphia, Jesus says, you're being persecuted and abused and marginalized, but this is opening doors that would otherwise remain closed. Wow. They hyper endured. They genuinely believed that closed doors led to open ones. And they genuinely believed, and this is crucial, and this is where we come somewhere between the key and the pillar. We'll get to the pillar. Is that they believe there's a master artist, a grand designer, who owns the design and knows the purpose for which the design came into being. So that when suffering comes into your life of any kind, when there is a closed door, it's not random, it's not unknown, it does not catch God by surprise. And if you begin to understand Jesus' message to the Philadelphians, you will become a rock 
and you will endure even when culture departs from God, even when everything around you is falling apart because you continue to say to yourself, what God opens, no one can shut. What God shuts, no one can open. When you do that and you understand that he has the rightful authority to do whatever is necessary in your life to bring those far from God near, and when you recognize, though, that there is a promise in the midst of all that, that you will become a pillar, you will endure. Okay, what's the pillar? Chapter 3, verse 12, the one who is victorious, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God. Never again will they leave it. I will write on them the name of my God and the name of the city of my God on New Jerusalem, the New Jerusalem, which is coming down out of heaven from God. And I will also write on them my new name. Now notice quickly, we're told if we endure, or rather, let me back up on that, if we understand he holds the key to open and close doors, then we will become a pillar. That means we will endure. Now, a pillar is in the temple. So it means that if you're a pillar in the temple, you never leave the presence of God because the, the temple represents the presence of God. Well, now you and I are the temple of the Holy Spirit. He's telling us that no matter what we face, whatever difficulty, whatever difficult door God opens and requires you to walk through, at the same time, you will sense this overwhelming, overpowering, prevailing presence of God which may, almost makes in the lives of people, if you read their testimony, it almost makes going through the struggle worth it because you get a special revelation, an overpowering revelation of the love and the compassion and the wisdom of Christ Jesus. God grants you this revelation of himself. This is exactly what Job tells us. Before I had heard about you, now my eyes have seen you. He said, before I knew you in theory, but through this struggle... I feel like I see you face to face that I know who you truly are. And as a result, I can endure all this suffering, the likes of which most of us will never have to endure. And then Job says, I know that my Redeemer lives and in the end he will stand upon the earth. Now I've quoted this often, but in this context, I started asking the question, what is Job talking about? And why is it that suddenly he has the ability to endure all his loss? Well, who is God's redeemer? Or who is Job's redeemer, rather? And the answer is God. And God did stand upon the earth. So maybe we're not talking about the end of time when everything comes right. Maybe Job is saying, I know that my redeemer stands upon the earth. And the question is, when Jesus stood upon the earth, how did he face his furnace? How did he respond? And what did he do? Just like we would have. He said, let me out. He banged on the door and it did not open. He faced the ultimate door and found it closed. In other words, Jesus, the one who holds the keys, know what it, knows what it's like to face a locked door because he was locked out. In fact, Hebrews 2.18, because he himself suffered when he was tempted, do you not think Jesus was tempted to leave and flee the garden? Do you think he was not tempted to avoid the pain and the cup that the father was asking him to face? Of course he was. But because he himself suffered, Greatly when he was tempted, he was knocking on the door, it would not open. He is able to help those who are being tempted now. When Jesus faced the ultimate door, he found it closed. And what was his response? Not my will, but yours be done. By you and I knowing and understanding that, and in walking through the door of death and separation from God that Jesus was willing to do, it means that he walked through the only door that can ever really hurt us and nailed it shut forever. Because Jesus secured your salvation and eternity, the only door that could ever truly harm you has been forever shut. And as a result, you can rejoice even, even when it seems that God has taken you through a door that brings so much pain. You know, I read recently about a Japanese-American POW. He said, the torture and the death and the starvation and the cruelty was so overwhelming in the camp that we never allowed ourselves to laugh or cry. If we laughed, we were afraid that it would give us hope and we had none. If we cried, we were afraid that we would become so depressed and despondent we'd take our own lives. He said, but then we learned through our hidden radios and communication that the war was actually over, but it would be two more weeks before it reached us. So the war was over, but we were still being beaten and we were still suffering. It would take two more weeks before the war ended for us. 
But he said, now we were able to laugh and cry because we knew we were going to be rescued and saved and redeemed. Folks, the message about our heart, and it's a hard one, when we fully give it over to Jesus, we start to recognize that we are no longer ourselves in the sense that we don't own our own lives. We've been bought with the price. And everything that needed to be done for us has been done on the cross of Jesus. And now he reserves the sovereign right to use us as a means to his end, but it's a good end. And as he uses us to help people far from God come near, he reveals himself to us with great compassion and empathy, reminding us that the only door that could ever destroy us or truly hurt us has been locked forever shut. We will pass over death into life. And so, if you want to endure, you must remember nothing comes into your life by accident. Christ sends you through the open doors of your life so that people far from him might come near. And I guess it's true that we are indeed Saturday people living in a Friday world waiting on Sunday to come. I love that statement, and I've used it in a rather dramatic form in the past, but I'd like to end the message just by using it in a kind of solemn, peaceful encouragement to you. Because it is Friday, and America is running further and further away from God. Christ followers are going to pay a heavy price. It's Friday, but Sunday is coming when God will gather his children into his arms and give them a new name that will last forever. It is Friday, and Christians are being ridiculed and mocked and often hated. It's Friday, but Sunday is coming when the people of God see the people of this world come and fall down at their feet and acknowledge that God has forever loved us. It's Friday, and too many Jesus followers are suffering in sickness and the disease of a fallen world. Yes, doors that God has allowed us to walk through, But Sunday is coming when there will be no more crying or mourning or pain and the old order of things has passed away. And yes, it's Friday when our losses seem so unnecessary and our loved ones are so sorely missed, but that's Friday. Sunday's coming when everything we've lost will be replaced to an infinitely greater degree. When we see the child that we lost, the mother or father who died, the grandfather or grandmother, suddenly all appear. And we realize they had been safe in the arms of the Father all along. That when they walked through the door of death, the road to life eternal waited for them on the other side. Folks, if you want to know if your heart is right, all you have to do is ask one question. What matters most to you? And if it is the kingdom of God, the only way that could ever happen is if Christ Jesus has come into your heart and not only changed what you do, but what you want to do. And your primary mission in life is say, God, here am I, send me, use me so that those far from you might come near. Recognizing the entire time that because he has walked through the only door that could ever truly hurt you, you will never walk alone. Father, thank you for the truth of the book of Revelation as it applies to the churches at Sardis and Philadelphia. I pray our eyes would be open that it is possible for us to endure incredible hardship. And I wonder, I wonder now if we're reading this text now because you're preparing us for what is to come. And I pray that your church would endure knowing that if she endures, you will open doors that we never thought possible And people we never thought possible far from God will come near and say, God has always loved me. In Christ's name, amen.